and I would like to welcome you all to our launching event on a special issue on environmental peace building in the International Affairs Journal. And I wanted to say that I'm very pleased and happy to, to welcome and actually introduce to this event, which I believe yeah, marks new territory for us here at the OEC Academy and I'd say for the OEC in general, as much as I'm able to speak for the OEC. Why is that? First of all, I believe that the OEC has a lot to say and a lot to do when it comes to environmental risks, as they often phrase it. In fact, of course, environmental affairs are part of the second dimension of the OEC. But if you look or have a quick look over the activities and the programs that OEC implements, for example, as part of the of the office of the coordinator of the OSCE's economic and environmental affairs, you will find that peace building, environmental peace building, is less prominent. The OSC usually talks about risks, about dangers, about threats, everything that falls under security and preventing bad things from happening. It's less a focus on trying to, to, to formulate an idea about how to relate peace to environment. And I'm very happy that today's discussion a little bit opens and broadens uh, this debate. For us, I would love to say that we at the Academy are a little bit wider than the rest of the OEC, but we are not. I'm very happy to have Mirza as one of our colleagues working in this direction. Even more so happy to have today's event uh, promoting this debate. While, while this event is an unmarked territory for us, uh, in a second regard is that the cases we're going to look today are from Africa, South America, Southeast Asia. There is not much about Central Asia or the wider OEC region. I believe it's the first time that I'm introducing in an event where the case studies discussed are in their entirety outside of the OEC region. I like that very much because it compels us to start a comparison, to get out of our, first of all, Central Asian um, 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 circle, but also out of the, of the view of the OSCE and its participating states. We have to compare, we have to see how we can learn from other world regions to understand then how to promote ideas of environmental peace building and its related efforts, conditions, limitations and opportunities um, to the situation and the changes we, we experience here in Central Asia. In that regard, I believe in both talking about peace building, environment and environmental peace building, as well as looking beyond the confines of the region of Central Asia, uh, two steps forward that are quite necessary. I'm very happy to have Tobias Ile to be the moderator of today's event. I would like to very shortly introduce him to you. Tobias is a lecturer in politics and policy at Murdoch University if I'm not mistaken, also affiliated with the Technical University in Braunschweig. Um, he has worked extensively on conflict dynamics, peace building, environmental politics, climate change, and disasters and international security. And he has published widely in various uh, journals from Global Environmental Politics, Journal of Peace Research, Nature, Climate Change, and World Development, among others. He has Due to his expertise, of course, consulted with a range of, of um, decision makers around the world and has been also giving or sharing his expertise with the public. He's a founding member and director of the Environmental Peacebuilding Association. And as I said, I'm very happy that he has agreed to moderate today's event. Thank you so much, Tobias. With that, the last note to be said from my side as introducer and host of this event is to thank those who in the background have made this possible. I'm grateful to our supporters at the OSCE, of course, without which the OSCE Academy could not perform and implement its activities. With regard to our research activities, we are very grateful to the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, who helps us build up our research capacity and funds our researchers here in Bishkek. Thank you so much also to all of you who participate and will today present their research and the results of their research, and for those who participate, listen in, and engage in the debate. With that, I come to a close and hand over to Tobias for the moderation. Thank you so much. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you sit, and a warm welcome to this panel on environmental peace building, which is designed as a launch event 
um, to this special issue of international affairs. But before I start my talk, I would like to join the, the thank youing um, that Alexander just begun. Um, I would like to thank you, Alexander and his team at the OECD Academy um, for hosting this event, which is a really good forum to, to promote these, um, the special issue and to engage in broader debates about environmental peace building, both in Central Asia and beyond. Um, and I would also like to, um, to thank Mir Sahusa for um, organizing and initiating his ideas around the event because um, he was really behind this and used a lot of initiative and dedication to make this happen. Um, let me briefly share my screen with you. I hope you can all see the presentations. Okay, so um, the purpose of this talk is to give a very brief background into environmental peace building and um, the broader debates underpinning the special issue, basically to contextualize the four excellent research presentations to follow. Um, and as perhaps some of you are already aware, there has been a growing debate about um, environmental scarcity, resource scarcity, climate change, and violent conflict. Um, starting really kicking off in the 1990s with some predecessors in earlier years, uh, as promoted by, for instance, this book, Thomas Homer Dixon. And um, around the year 2000, there was a bit of, let's say, um, un people started to get a bit uncomfortable around this debate for virtually two reasons. So the first one being that um, if you only focus on competition and conflict or resource scarcity and environmental change, we are basically ignoring that environmental issues also present a transboundary opportunity or challenge that groups can join forces and cooperate on. Um, basically highlighting cooperation and peace as a response to environmental stress rather than, than conflict and violence. Um, and secondly, a growing realization that um, without paying attention to the environmental dimensions of peace building, being that recovering livelihoods so that former combatants um, get a secure livelihood, um, for instance, by farming or by having access to, to, to water, um, to sanitation, or by repairing urban infrastructure that has been repaired, that has been destroyed during the war as a key task for post-conflict service providing. So there was a growing realization that um, the environmental services and issues are crucial for post-conflict peace building. And perhaps this debate was started by Ken Conker and Jeff Bedelko with their volume, Environmental Peacemaking, and a large number of follow-up publications. And I'm saying that this topic remains as important as it was 20 years ago when the first publications were launched, perhaps even more important. Um, just to pick one environmental problem, which is climate change, you can see human uh, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, and you see a steep upward trend that was somewhat flattened by Corona, um, but it's not not really a sustainable long term uh, flattening of the curve, and the emissions are still very very high, perhaps higher than in the last few tens or hundreds of thousands of years, um, and that follows up with or that aligns with another a lot of follow up environmental problems about biodiversity loss, water scarcity, increasing natural disasters. Um, and on the one hand, um, you can see here the number of armed conflicts worldwide since the Second, Second World War. And what you can basically see is that around 2014, 15, they, ride, they rose up to a very steep level and stayed on this plateau in 2019 was actually the year with the most active armed conflict since the end of the Second World War. Um, so both environmental stress and peace and conflict remain core topics or challenges of our time. So investigating the intersections between peace and the environment is even more important than it was perhaps 20 years ago. Um, for the purpose of the special issue that this event is the launch event for, 
we defined environmental peace building as comprising the multiple approaches and pathway by which the management of environmental issues is integrated in and can support conflict prevention, mitigation, resolution, and recovery. So it basically takes a broad look and saying, how do environmental issues affect um, peace building from the prevention of conflict to any kind of post-conflict or post-civil war activities? And this is reflected very well by the papers in the special issue and the presentations we have today. Um, so the special issue has just been launched in international affairs, which I think is remarkable in two regards. The first one is, is the first ever special issue of any journal on environmental peace building, um, 21 years after the conflict was first coined. Second of all, it's also a rather prominent journal. I think if you just go by impact factor, it's ranked fourth of, uh, of all international relations journals. Um, but it's also backed by Chatham House and Oxford University Press. Um, so it's a widely read, very, very decent journal that actually promotes this idea of environmental peace building after we had so many prominent special issues on climate conflict and environmental security. So I think that's a major step forward. Um, and the special issue contains 11 articles and this presents evidence from 12 countries all along Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and the Pacific region. Um, and as for your information, as a promotional measure, the special issue is currently available. I mean, some of the articles are open access, but at the moment, the whole special issue is open access. So in case you're not sure whether your university library or your institution grants you access to the journal at the moment, Wherever you are, you can just go on that homepage and um, download all of the articles free of charge without any barriers. Um, and in the introductory article, um, the seven guest editors um, who I've just cited, which I'm one of them, um, outline basically five pathways for future work on environmental peace building. I'm going to mention them just very briefly, but several of the presentations today touch upon them very centrally. Um, the first one is we need more attention of bottom-up approaches, that is approaches that are implemented and designed on the local level with minimal or even no external international state-led interference, because these dynamics are increasingly successful but not yet well recognized. Um, Gender is an important cross-cutting topic with a lot of intersections, both with how environmental change and how peace and conflict issues are perceived and experienced. It has so far only played a minor role in debates around environmental peace building. Conflict-sensitive programming results from the insight that a lot of well-meant environmental or peace building projects in the past had negative side effects in terms of um, fueling new conflicts that need to be addressed. There's this whole issue of big data and frontier technology, which are increasingly used by UN agencies, NGOs, and commercial actors, um, and which research still grasps to take to, to basically conceptualize the role they play. And the fifth topic is monitoring and evaluation of environmental peace building practices and environmental peace building success. Um, so without further ado, I will leave it to our four outstanding presenters today. I look forward to the presentations and discussions. Just as a brief, let's say, teaser, um, for any one of you who's interested in the topic of environmental peace building, there's the Environmental Peace Building Association, which you become a member, but which also provides a lot of useful resources for non-members, including a library, a newsletter, job and conference updates, and so on. So I also encourage you to check out this online resource. Fantastic. Um, I stop my sharing my screen now and hand over to Sabrina Welter. Um, Sabrina Welter is one of the contributors to the special issue previously at the Peace Academy, uh, Rhineland Palpatine at the University of, of Landau. Um, and now a research fellow at the University of Freiburg in Germany. And Sabrina will talk on formalization as a tool for environmental peace building, drawing on her research or the research of the Autos Collective in Sierra Leone. Sabrina, the floor is yours. Ah, before that, um, I would briefly encourage you, sorry, um, to do that. 
If you have any questions, we will have a Q&A session after the four presentations. You can already write your questions in the chat and I actually encourage that. Or you can write your question in the chat or just raise your hand after the four presentations are done. But as I said, you can already use the chat function now to post your questions. Sabrina, the floor is yours now, truly. Great, thank you, Tobias. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, let me just do this here. Okay, so, well, thank you, Tobias, uh, for the introduction and also to the OSE Academy for this uh, very interesting invitation today. Um, as Tobias said, my name is Sabrina. I am a doctoral candidate at the University of Freiburg in Germany. And today I will be presenting some of the most uh, interesting findings of uh, the paper that we published for this special issue with my colleagues Christina Ankenbrand and Nina Engwicht. Uh, we titled our paper Formalization as a Tool for Environmental Peacebuilding Insights from Artisanal um, and Small Scale Mining in Liberia and Sierra Leone. So for those of you who aren't really familiar with what artisanal and small scale mining is, there is no agreed upon definition. Um, however, some of their most, its most common characteristics is that um, it's largely an informal activity, um, that it's very labor intensive and um, that extracts minerals uh, using low levels of mechanization. And in the places where artisanal and small scale mining or ASM um, is present, it has been seen as a double-edged sword, uh, mostly because it has become a vital source of income and livelihood security for many rural communities in the global south. Um, but it, it's also because it is associated with uh, problems like armed conflict, like human rights violations, like corruption and environmental destruction. And I'm pretty sure that you're familiar also with uh, the role that so-called uh, conflict diamonds had in fueling the wars in, in Liberia and Sierra Leone, right? And Mostly because of this um, ASM's double face, um, there has been an increased need then to intervene the sector through what it is known as formalization, which we in our article broadly define as the integration of informal activities into uh, formal regulatory frameworks. And ever since formalization as a policy tool, policy tool started to be implemented uh, in, the, in the ASM sector, um, it has been considered kind of like the recipe to meet, mitigate the sector's challenges, especially in post-conflict countries. And most of the early efforts then in post-conflict countries, countries um, where most of the uh, early formalization efforts were then directed towards addressing uh, conflict financing, uh, but then they ignored um, or didn't prioritize uh, the livelihood dimension of, of ASM. And this is, for example, the case of the Kimberley Process Certification Scheme, which was born more or less from uh, the wars in Liberia and Sierra Leone, and which focused on breaking the link between minerals and violence, uh, but then ignored um, the livelihood dimension of ASM. And however, ASM has been, eh, sorry, livelihood improvement has been identified as a crucial dimension for, for peace. And this is something that environmental peace building has been focusing a lot upon where experts claim that any type of um, natural resource sector intervention should include at least three dimensions to uh, build sustainable peace. The first one is to establish security. The second one is to promote good governance. And the third dimension is to improve uh, the economy and livelihoods. However, for a long time, there has been a, a very strong focus on the first two dimensions. So on establishing security, um, mostly understood in a narrow way. So to establish negative peace, and to promote good governance through um, transparency and accountability measures, uh, which was something, for example, that the, the Kimberley Process Certification Scheme did in, in these two countries. Um, and this is why, especially very recently, environmental peace building experts have called then for an increased focus on the development of local livelihoods, because um, they claim that um, through this uh, focus on, on, on livelihood development, uh, some of the underlying causes of conflict like uh, poverty or inequality can be addressed and therefore um, more, a more sustainable peace uh, can be built. Um, and this is especially or in particularly important for the ASM sector because it is through livelihood improvement that we see that ASM can actually contribute to peace, right? 
and also because a lot has already been done in terms of establishing security and promoting good governance, but really what is missing uh, from this piece of the puzzle is then um, the livelihood dimension. And with this background in mind, what we did for our article was then to investigate uh, the impact of ASM formalization on sustainable peace uh, by focusing on the livelihood effects of formalization in the diamond sector in Liberia and Sierra Leone. Um, now, going back to formalization, as I mentioned before, uh, this early formalization approaches uh, really tried to address the, 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 the issue with conflict financing. And they saw in measures like uh, licensing minors and registering them, uh, and also uh, in, in tracing um, minerals, kind of like sufficient measures to, to deal with informality and also to develop the sector, right? Mm. However, many of these early formalization um, interventions really produced unsatisfactory outcomes, uh, mostly because they lacked the positive incentives for actors to comply. And as a result, in, in most of the places where these early formalization approaches were uh, implemented, you saw that informal payments and corruption was still present, that, for example, ASM um, workers uh, had little access to benefits like credits and capacity building trainings. Many of the formalization um, measures remained really ad hoc and, and didn't uh, include the livelihood dimension of, of ASM. And as a result, also many ASM communities then uh, remained high, highly marginalized and underdeveloped. However, uh, I mean, basically because of this shortcomings of early formalization approaches, um, then there was a, a call for a shift towards broader um, understandings of formalization that basically include the livelihood potential of artisan and small scale mining in the, into the heart of uh, formalization with the idea that this will then create better uh, living and working conditions for ASM workers and communities, but also that this will then create these positive incentives for buying and for compliance. Now, moving on to the case studies, this was precisely what happened in both countries. So after the shortcomings of ASM formalization um, in, the, in the diamond sector, both countries then decided to, um, um, uh, to, to uh, adopt a livelihood-oriented uh, approach to formalization, uh, where they saw or they see formalization as this way of providing positive incentives uh, to miners and host communities in the form of livelihood development, uh, but also to the government through increased uh, revenue generation. Shortly to our article, uh, my colleagues conducted between six and 10 weeks of, of field work in both countries. And we studied three formalization interventions, uh, cooperatives in Liberia, ethical sourcing schemes in, in Sierra Leone, and a community-based natural management, natural resource management initiative also in Sierra Leone. And in general, what we found is that the schemes so far really have not produced any substantial effect in terms of livelihood improvement. And what we did in order to, to claim this, uh, we, we identified three pathways through which um, formalization can uh, improve livelihoods. So income security, working conditions and community uh, benefits. And well, what we found is basically that in terms of income security, there are only marginal improvements in both, both countries. And on the contrary that, for example, traditional forms of labor organization and unequal profit sharing, which um, I mean, it's very present in this context and, and that makes um, working relations very exploitative. Um, well, these are still present. There has been really no improvement uh, regarding working conditions, which we focus here on health and safety. These also remain very similar to the conditions before ASM formalization was implemented. And regarding community uh, contributions, this also uh, really depends still on donations by fortunate miners. And just briefly then to conclude, we find it super important that future research and practice uh, really uh, pays more attention to how challenging it is to um, really improve livelihoods through formalization. Because as you can see here, outcomes are not always as expected, even if formalization uh, approaches uh, have at their heart uh, improving livelihoods, right? And here, and this is perhaps a very interesting conclusion that we that we that we or a finding that that we had is that actually these three interventions that we looked at uh, over the course of their implementation, they lost this initial uh, focus on livelihoods and then went back to prioritizing legality and traceability 
of, of diamond extraction and trade, right? And if formalization is really to contribute to peace building, it is important that this doesn't happen during implementation, right? That the livelihood dimension is still relevant because otherwise then we risk um, more or less um, the institutionalization of exclusion of exploitation and corruption, which then of course can harm um, the entire peace building process. With that, thank you so much for your attention. And I will then stop sharing my screen and move on. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sabrina. That was a very, an excellent presentation and summary of a very insightful paper, which I enjoyed reading a lot. Most of the papers we presented today, I've read multiple times as an editor. So I can tell you they already were very strong to start with, and then they improved considerably over the process because we also, international affairs is pretty good in organizing strong reviewers for the papers. Um, as I mentioned initially, be very happy to either write your questions in the chat already now or otherwise simply um, wait till the presentations are over and raise your hand. Um, so our next, spe next speaker is Hector Morales Munoz from the Humboldt University in Berlin, who is also a research fellow at the Leibniz Center for Agricultural Landscape Research, which is, if I'm not mistaken, is also in Berlin. And um, Hector will talk on the impacts of environmental peace building in Colombia and how they can be assessed, hence speaking, um, very strongly to the monitoring and evaluation concerns um, I've already mentioned at the beginning. Uh, Hector, the floor is yours. Uh, sorry, yes. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for attending the, the event. Thank you very much, the OSCE, for the uh, kind invitation. Um, yes, I am uh, right now in Colombia. As you can see, it's still uh, in the evening here, but I'm very glad uh, to be uh, presenting. So I'm going to present uh, our paper that is called Assessing Impacts of Environmental Peace Building in Caqueta, Colombia, uh, from a multi-stakeholder perspective. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of introduction, uh, especially making emphasis on the case study that is a Caqueta in the Amazon region of Colombia. And I'm going to explain a little bit why sustainable land use systems uh, could be a, 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 a practice of environmental peace building. Uh, then I'm going to present the, the research methodology and results of the, of the study. Um, okay, so the case studies Colombia, uh, I, I make this, this broad question piece without nature. And um, I most say that Colombia is kind of a great uh, study for environmental peace building. So uh, in Colombia, we uh, signed a peace agreement or the government signed a peace agreement between the FAR guerrillas and the, uh, with, the FAR, with the FAR guerrillas in 2000. And 16, it was uh, ratified by the Congress after a struggle uh, with a referendum that didn't um, came through, and there was lots of hope uh, after the after the the peace agreement was ratified. Lots of joy, however, where we can see here um, the actually delivery uh, hand on of the weapons from the from the guerrillas uh, that was also supervised by the Security Council. The UN Security Council with a with a political mission. However, there are many many challenges in the implementation, um, mostly because there has been a staggering number of uh, human rights and environmental uh, defenders killed uh, since the sign of the peace agreement. Is the numbers um, uh, de uh, vary depending on the source, but it, it is almost to reach. Uh, a thousand people killed after the peace agreement. So most say that this is not a post-conflict situation, but a, but a post-agreement situation. And uh, also there are uh, many challenges in the, with regards to climate action because 
there is a high price of, of the peace agreement uh, uh, implementation. And there is uh, that the deforestation in the Amazon had increased by almost 40% um, in Colombia, especially in the, in the Amazon region. Um, and the hypothesis there is that there is a vacuum of power uh, that was left by the guerrillas um, uh, after, they, after they left. They, they had like a de facto uh, governance mechanisms to impede that farmers and other actors enter into the, into the, into the jungle. So it's not because they were very environmentalists. Uh, they had committed some uh, terrorist attacks against infrastructure that uh, detrimental at the deforestation. Um, but it has happened right now. So the specific case uh, that I studied, that we studied was um, the case of Caquetá, which has these overlapping challenges uh, happening uh, in Colombia. So uh, the first thing is that uh, it is uh, the entry point of the Amazon and uh, a lots of natural parks. And it was um, highly affected by the armed conflict. So it was uh, the, one of the main far guerrilla territories. And as you can see here in the map, um, the agricultural frontier has started grow, uh, going deeper into, into the Amazon. So when the Andes in South America enter into Colombia, um, they split into three chain of mountains and Caquetá is right in the slope of the, of the um, uh, eastern uh, chain of mountains and it's the entry point to the Amazon basin, which starts right here. So uh, it has also, it is the, the entry point of um, uh, biodiversity parks or reservoirs. One is, uh, that is, one is called the Serrania de Chiribiquete. If you can take a look at videos uh, in YouTube, you will see how, amaz how amazing it is. It is the size of Belgium. And I say uh, videos in YouTube because it's really, really hard to get uh, in there, you have to take an helicopter and it's very, um, it's not the, the most secure area, uh, but it's very beautiful. But as you can see, the, the deforestation has had parts are, are starting to enter into these, into the, into these uh, natural parks, so are, are getting very close. And um, in this region, there, are, there have been decades of unsustainable land use. That means that Actually, the historical process of get, uh, arriving into this region of populations, uh, populating this region, uh, happened because imagine you are um, a farmer, you are displaced by the, by the violence, and um, you depend a lot of land, right? So uh, the government in the 70s uh, made this policy program to grant uh, landless farmers access to land by actually promoting to cut forests, to enter into the jungle, they call it clean the land and establish some farms. So the land uses that are that arrive there are more uh, coming from uh, the culture of the Andean region. So like establishing farms, uh, putting some cattle, etc. And this has changed uh, in the time. Um, However, many of the populations uh, come with this, with, with this culture. So right now the, the, the demands are different. Uh, the demands from the global uh, north and, and, and from, the, from, from the challenge that uh, climate change presents uh, is very much to protect these areas and not to uh, further go into the agricultural um, or to not expand the agricultural frontier. So in this region, there are different actors with different power symmetries. So there is the, there is the farmers, there are also illegal loggers. Um, now they're starting to enter min mining companies, which are legal and illegal along the Caquetá uh, river basin, which they all the, of the rivers that uh, are born here um, uh, arrive at the end at the, at the Amazon river. So it's a very important ecosystem. There are also indigenous communities, victims of violence, ex-combatants, uh, new criminal groups, especially in the south, there is also a uh, coca crops uh, plantations. So it's a very interesting uh, case because there are also many interesting initiatives. Um, so now coming to sustainable land use systems, these are defined to the, as the allocation of land to different uses across a landscape. 
balancing economic, social, and environmental values. Most precisely, uh, it can be done by designing special uh, uses in farms that combine uh, sustainable agricultural production with environmental conservation or even restoration of nature. So I conducted my research in the context of a project that is implemented by the Center for International Tropical Agriculture, which is called Implementing Sustainable Agricultural uh, Land Livestock Systems for simultaneously targeting forest conservation for climate change mitigation and peace building. So they are, they are aiming to, to tackle both challenges, right? And they have this approach at the farm level, for example, designing uh, agroforestry systems uh, with cocoa or with um, cattle ranching, which, which is a big issue in the Amazon. Um, uh, and also they have the approach of a, a landscape-based uh, approach. So furthering or connecting the different uh, farms and also a market and finance approach with incentives such as um, paying for ecosystem services and Red Plus and connecting uh, value chains. So connecting the farmers uh, to grant the livelihoods into a, into a value chain that has a zero deforestation. Um, right, so my research question started uh, as a, um, very broad uh, research research question. So what are the possible impacts of these kind of projects or these kind of systems into uh, peace building, right? And when you talk about peace building dimensions, you enter into, into a universe of literature in, in a very broad area, especially if you're talking about positive peace building. So structural and institutional change and development, justice and healing, violence prevention, and from this, there are many dimensions or factors such as transitional justice, trauma healing, humanitarian action, etc. So I uh, came across a very important message. So it's very important to prioritize to, to get into the uh, research. So I start answer, uh, answering these questions. Which dimensions of peace building should be prioritized to assess SLAS? And how and through which mechanisms are these dimensions being affected by SLAS? I must say, I must say that I, am, uh, I come from uh, the field of peace building in practice, uh, working with uh, various organizations in Colombia. So um, I was trying to bridge this peace building practice into the conservation and agricultural science area. Um, so the methodology was, I started with a literature review of over 100 documents in the fields of environmental peace building, peace building indicators, monitoring and evaluation, conflict sensitivity approaches. Then uh, I conducted some semi-structured interviews with experts in many fields and uh, in many scales. And I conducted three workshops. So one was a workshop with the practitioners of this last project. One was a workshop with global experts in this amazing uh, first environmental peace building conference in California. And then I conducted a workshop with experts on the field in Caquetá, uh, including indigenous, uh, indigenous and local farmers, as well as NGOs and representatives from the government. Here are some pics from the, from the workshop in Caquetá. And finally, finally we conducted a, a small uh, uh, survey or questionnaire um, to further assess these uh, results. So on the literature on, on environmental peace building, you can see that there are many, there are very few uh, uh, approaches for actually monitoring and, and evaluating environmental peace building as, as such. There are some advances in peace building, but on the, on the conjunction, there are very few. So one example is uh, the training manual of environmental peace building. Uh, launched by the by Conservation International, and they, it talks uh, mainly about conflict sensitivity in environmental conservation. Um, another one by Adelphi uh, is um, one that is very concentrated on climate fragility, risks, and conflict, which is very interesting also because it can open the field um, to um, uh, do a, an in-depth conflict analysis of the threats that are present in the regions. Um, however, as I say, there is a lack of systematic knowledge and it's very important to, for monitoring and evaluating 
missions uh, to prevent the risk factors of environmental peace building. This paper uh, that I recommend that uh, Tobias C. They wrote uh, about it is the six Ds of, uh, of uh, environmental peace building, such as the deleg legitimization of the state, the politicization, deterioration into conflict, displacement, and, and uh, deterioration of the environment. So there are also lack, there was also a, a gap in the research uh, for the tracking real impacts on peace building as such. So after reviewing the, the literature, um, I found these uh, five uh, dimensions, uh, which are socioeconomic inclusion. So basically granting sustainable access to secure livelihoods, then peace and culture and conflict management, which is, are defined as the capacities for addressing conflict in a systematic way. Also transitional justice, which, which comprehends truth commission, compensation to victims, reintegration and reconciliation initiatives. And in the field of environmental peace building, this is uh, not very much research, but there are some initiatives where um, uh, restorative justice is implemented through the restoration of ecosystems. For example, former combatants um, committing to restore ecosystems as a way of reparation to victims. And then there is also governance, uh, which is defined by the way of societies make decisions regarding collective problems and security, which is basically the stabilization and the monopoly of violence uh, by the state. So to the results, um, since, as I told you, I, I did um, a, stake, a multi stakeholder perspective. So in this figure, you can see um, on the X axis, the dimensions. Um, and then uh, the prioritization that the actors did um, uh, as seen by different colors, right? So the first thing that, that emerged is that the practitioners had very clear that the focus should be on socioeconomic inclusion. That would be the dimension to be prioritized to assess these kind of implementations and also uh, governance, right? However, uh, if you talk to the, to the local experts in, in, in Caquetá, they prioritize peace culture and socioeconomic inclusion, not that much governance. And um, the explanation for this is that they claim that there are some spaces for governance to, to make decisions. However, they like um, uh, culture to negotiate more and to um, tackle the conflict uh, in a systematic way. Victor, um, could you finish within the next 30 seconds or so, please? Yeah, right, sorry, sorry about that. So the mechanisms uh, that they explain why they assess this is that uh, generating livelihoods and income is very important for equity, for establishing peasant markets, uh, and especially for having resilience against illegal economies, and also um, increasing trust because uh, it can create, implementing these programs can create a new community of practice uh, belonging to, to stay uh, in the rural areas. The building governance is very important uh, since it can uh, further uh, redesign the, the governance mechanisms that are already there, that are important to take and uh, to get involved in land use planning. And also, for example, in creating environmental protections or restoration of ecosystems, etc. Um, so, as, the, as conclusions, the main dimension to be assessed by these kind of projects should be livelihoods and and uh, uh, so socioeconomic inclusion, so involving livelihoods and participation, since diverse, inclusive livelihoods increase resilience of vulnerable populations against illegal economies. The second uh, priority by most of the stakeholders is governance and is understood as a process that facilitates the creation of cooperative networks, uh, resolving in the long term land uses and building trust in this kind of implementations. It is done by co designing of solutions. And to finish, it is important to embrace capacity building in conflict transformation and negotiation within, within these projects because. Even though these technical approaches open uh, some dialogue spaces, the um, uh, conflict does not resolute by itself. So, and these spaces are also not neutral. So it needs to be uh, embraced this conflict transformation in a systematic way. Also include do no harm approaches and have be aware of the political context that these projects are working on. 
And also, um, it is important to assess these programs on the different scales of intervention. So there are some impacts at the farm level, but if you measure the value chain level, there are some other impacts and dimensions that you should be assessing. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Sorry for taking uh, much time. Thanks a lot, Hector. Uh, I understand it's a very rich paper with quite, quite a long list of valuable insights. Um, so it's not easy to put it into the time, but thanks a lot for the valuable input. Um, directly coming to our third presentation, and I'm already seeing the chat already has a question. So if anyone wants to join, ask further questions in the chat, please feel free to. Um, our third presenter today is Dr. Mirza Sadakwat Huda from the OSCE Academy, um, who is a, research, a postdoctoral research fellow at the Academy, a contributor to the special issue, and also one of the main organizers of today's events. Um, big thanks again for leading this, Mirza. Um, and Mirza will talk on ecological responses to ethno-nationalistic populism with a focus on South Asia. Mirza, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tobias. Um, let me just share my slide. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, um, firstly, thank you, Tobias, and all the presenters and the participants for their time today. And uh, thank you to all my colleagues at OSC Academy for, um, for their hard work in uh, you know, getting this uh, conference organized. So my paper essentially uh, tried to ask the question about whether environmental peace building can respond to the global rise in ethno-nationalistic populism, and particularly in the context of grassroots environmental peace building. So essentially uh, youth engagement and education. So just I'll just start off with some introductory information. Um, so in the last 10 years, we have witnessed a global rise in uh, illiberal policies and nativist ideologies and uh, a decline in democratic and liberal norms. And this has happened across different regime types. So um, established democracies like India, um, hybrid regimes like Pakistan and liberal um, autocratic regimes um, have all uh, faced an uptick in, um, in uh, the reduction of democratic and liberal norms and increase in autocracy. And um, Bart Bronikowski, who is one of the experts on, uh, uh, on uh, ethno-nationalistic populism, has argued that uh, this sort of radical policies occur along three interconnected phenomena. So um, one is um, ultranationalism, the other is populism, and the uh, third one is um, autocratic, uh, auto uh, autocratization. And what I'm interested is in um, ethno-nationalistic ethno populism and its impact on uh, mainstreaming xenophobia and demonization of mainstream, mainstream minority groups. So uh, my research essentially has looked into how ethno-nationalistic populism has um, exacerbated the ideational sources of conflict. So essentially, um, issues of identities in international conflict. So with the environmental peace building literature, there is some research on um, um, ideational sources of conflicts, but most of these research has focused on intrastate issues. So essentially conflicts within the state. So for example, Castro um, in his uh, journal article in World Development has looked at how ethnic conflicts in uh, Sudan has exacerbated the civil war there, and he has looked at environmental peace building as a solution to those issues. 
But there aren't too many studies that have looked at ideational issues as they related to conflict between states. However, some studies do exist and most of them have looked at um, how xenophobia and uh, stereotyping exacerbates conflict between Israel and Palestine. And in contemporary times, um, a, a handful of uh, academic papers have looked at grassroots mechanisms of countering these sort of xenophobic and um, stereo stereotyping of identities that leads to conflict. And uh, one of the leading studies in this is by Aiden Dubey, who looks at how um, education on the environment can counter uh, xenophobia and uh, religious stereotyping uh, between the youth in uh, Israel and Palestine. So the reason that I chose South Asia as a case study uh, for my research is because um, the conflicts in South Asia are inherently related to ideational issues. So the, the Hindu Muslim conflict that has uh, perpetuated um, you know, wars between India and Pakistan and conflicts between India and some of the smaller countries of the nation um, has existed uh, since 1947. And um, since the rise of ethno-nationalistic populism in India and Pakistan and some other countries of South Asia, these ideational issues have been um, amplified. So uh, religious and ethnic fault lines have uh, become larger. And uh, the conflict between India and Pakistan in recent decades have been framed um, around, the relig around religious conflict, um, around religious identities. And although India and Bangladesh had a very good relationship between the governments, um, the Indian government often, uh, well, not the, not the Indian government per se, but the, some representatives of uh, the current political party in India often um, partake in xenophobic rhetoric against um, Bangladeshi migrants in, in India. And this has led to, um, you know, conflation of identity, identities and, um, uh, you know, uh, undermine the relationship between broader citizenry in India and Bangladesh. Um, so ethno-nationalistic populism is definitely a very crucial issue in South Asia. Um, and so is the issue of ideational conflicts. And also South Asia is one of the most vulnerable countries, uh, vulnerable regions in the world to um, climate change. Um, uh, it, it, the melting of the glaciers in the Hindu Kush mountains and the fact that Bangladesh is essentially a large delta and um, the water crises in various parts of India and Pakistan means that uh, it is very, very crucial that these countries work collectively towards um, the environment. But this has not happened because of the issues mentioned above. And um, the reason that I've um, focused on grassroots mechanism is um, firstly, state-to-state um, -state cooperation between India and Bangladesh and India Pakistan is not um, suited to counter xenophobic rhetoric because this is a societal sort of uh, phenomena which can't really be countered by um, you know scientists collaborating and also the region is home to um, 1.9 billion people who are under the age of 24 and they are vulnerable to xenophobic rhetoric. So um, I've done two case studies on um, South Asia. Um, I don't know if I'll have time to talk about both of them. So uh, let me just speak about the first one. So the first case study is on the Sundarban mangrove forest. This is the largest mangrove forest in the world and, is, and it falls uh, in between Bangladesh and India. So it's about 10,000 kilometers square and uh, three, Three fifths of the rainforest fall in Bangladesh, and the rest is in India. And it is um, uh, extremely vulnerable to climate change. Um, there has been large scale deforestation, which has led to salmon intrusion. And um, uh, there, it is home to many uh, ecologically vulnerable uh, flora and fauna. And currently, there has been some amount of cooperation between India and Bangladesh on the Sundarban rainforest. Um, there was a memorandum of understanding signed in 2011 and there has been some engagement by the civil society as well, but none of these cooperation exists on the grassroots level. So to essentially look at 
um, similar similar sort of initiatives in other parts of the world. I looked at the Good Water Neighbors Program by Eco Peace Middle East, which is an organization based in the Middle East that um, essentially does environmental peace building programs. And the Good Water Neighbor Program brought together youth from Israel, Palestine, and Jordan, and um, uh, got them to live together, um, provided them with education, um, and uh, they, they went out into the field and interacted with the environment, which essentially, according to the studies done on um, this program, led to the breakdown of stereotypes um, that exists, uh, you know, um, of, of um, a particular, particular religious minorities. Um, and so uh, from the Good Water Neighbor Program, I highlighted two, two, two elements, which I think may be particularly suitable for um, grassroots programs on the Sundarbans. The first one is the youth camp. So uh, the youth camp can involve uh, youth from India and Bangladesh uh, living together um, in a particular um, in a particular area in the Sundarbans and learning about um, environmental interdependence, um, uh, the importance of conservation, which can potentially lead to um, cross-cultural, cross-ethnic, and cross-religious friendships, um, and this can lead to the breakdown of stereotypes. And the second element that I looked at is the training of teachers. So. Um, uh, in the, in the Good Water Neighbor programs, uh, teachers from Palestine, Israel, and Jordan got together to create a curriculum on, on, the, on environmental education. And this sort of uh, program can be replicated in the case of, um, of the Sundarbans. And this is particularly important because much of the curriculum in South Asia perpetuate uh, nationalistic and uh, xenophobic thought. So uh, to sort of undermine that, some kind of um, you know, broad curriculum on ecological interdependence can be very uh, beneficial towards uh, pluralistic identities. And um, in terms of broader effect of this sort of uh, program, um, I see this uh, program leading to youth leadership. So potentially the youth that um, engages in lots, this sort of uh, program can go back to their communities or their neighborhoods and um, uh, you know um, promote uh, pluralistic views or um, issues related to ecological interdependence and in regards to the teachers network um, uh, it, uh, if the teachers in Bangladesh and India get together in creating a curriculum this can potentially uh, lead to some form of long-term engagement on environmental education in South Asia, um, which will do much to, um, to create pluralistic identities and uh, the need to counter climate change collectively. Um, so very quickly, I'll just go through the, the second case study, uh, which is on the Thar Desert, in, uh, which falls between India and Pakistan. Uh, so the Thar Desert is one of the the largest tropical uh, deserts in the world. It's uh, shared. Um, I think um, eighty five percent is in India and the rest is in Pakistan, and it is also uh, similar to the Sundarbans in the sense that it it uh, is home to a large number of uh, vulnerable flora and fauna. And uh, it is densely populated, which has led to the deterioration of the environment. And while India and Pakistan has not undertaken any collaboration on um, conserving the tar, they have utilized the space on the tar desert to develop renewable energy. So essentially uh, in Rajasthan and in Gujarat on the Indian side of the tar desert, there are a large number of solar farms and wind farms and many more are being, um, are being constructed. And similarly, in Sindh and in Punjab side of Pakistan, um, several en uh, renewable energy projects have been developed. Uh, so, for example, the Kadi Azam uh, solar power plant is uh, just 100 kilometers from the border with, with India. So, while there is no uh, coll uh, official collaboration, um, uh, one of the potential pathways to collaborate um, uh, is the South Asian University. 
which is um, a product of the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, SARC, the regional body in South Asia. And the official um, sort of uh, objective of uh, SAU is to create regional identities and contribute to regional peace building. So um, I suggested that um, SAU can potentially provide um, courses and undertake research on renewable energy and desalination in arid areas with a focus on tar, which can potentially bring together uh, Pakistani and Indian students, um, uh, perhaps even doing field work in tar and um, undertaking uh, collaboration on, on, on research and education to break down once again, the stereotypes that exist across the border. And um, to do this, I've made some comparative uh, analysis with uh, the Araba Institute for Environmental Studies, which is a very interesting uh, organization uh, in Israel, which um, brings together students from uh, Israel, Palestine, Jordan, and other countries to um, work specifically on the environment, but with, um, with peace building goals in mind. So uh, the AIS has a leadership summit, which uh, encourages uh, the students to, uh, to uh, examine peace building opportunities through their education. They also create um, empathy between uh, different religious and ethnic groups who study at AIES. And uh, the AIES also focuses um, on arid regions. So they look at renewable energy in arid regions, um, the use of agriculture um, and desalination in arid regions, which, is, which overlaps with um, what can be done in, in the Thar Desert in terms of education. So um, to, to, uh, to amplify the potential of this sort of um, uh, tertiary education, perhaps similar courses in India and Pakistani national universities can be developed. And um, more importantly, um, the SAU can um, contribute to the development of environmental leaders in India and Pakistan who can emphasize interdependence in energy and water much more so than uh, religious and ethnic cleavages, which has uh, been perpetuated by um, ethnonationalistic populism in the last 10 years. And hopefully this will lead to some form of um, peace building in South Asia and also environmental contribution. Thank you very much. Great, thanks a lot, Mirza. Um, as with the previous presentations, I would encourage anyone to read the full papers actually, because 10 minutes presentation cannot um, give, give all the nuance and complexity that is developed in the papers and that is true for Mirza's paper as well. Um, but thanks again for the excellent presentations and for sharing the insights with us. Um, now, um, our fourth and final presenter is Dr. Beatrice Mosello from Adelphi in Berlin. Um, Beatrice is um, not an explicit contributor to the special issue. However, Adelphi uh, was involved in the process of the special issue. So Alexander Karius, the head of Adelphi was one of the guest editors and there has been continuous exchange between several authors and editors of the special issue with the work that Adelphi is doing, especially in the policy and consultation realm on climate security, environmental conflicts, and environmental peace building. Um, so there is a very strong indirect link. And I think also Beatrice is, um, is perhaps more than the other presenters. Also, I'd say everyone offers a broad range of takeaway points for policy and practice. Um, Beatrice working on, um, let's say, the border between research and then transferring the insights from studies into, into consultancy and practice uh, is well able to, to speak also to a range of practical concerns on the topics um, besides presenting some innovative insights from the project. So Beatrice, the floor is yours. Great. 
thank you very much Tobias and thank you to the OEC Academy Bishkek for organizing this very interesting discussion. I've been enjoying very much hearing uh, the presentations before me and taking notes, really interesting case studies and the insights um, to the literature. Um, and thank you so much again for the, um, to the OEC Academy um, also for inviting me uh, and inviting Adelphi to be part of uh, this event today. As Tobias said, uh, um, I haven't myself uh, directly contributed to the um, special issue, uh, but I'm hoping really to kind of um, bring in a bit of insights from uh, uh, our research and uh, uh, our work in the past few years looking at practice and programming in the field in the field of environmental peace building with a particular focus i would say uh, maybe on climate change and the climate security um, which we know that um, it is uh, uh, the impacts of climate change are exacerbating a lot of the environmental risks that we see at play in connection with conflict dynamics and that therefore we need to consider uh, for, for peace building. And particularly I'll, I'll build here on some of the research work that we've been conducting um, at Adelphi since 2011, um, me a bit, uh, uh, a bit later uh, since I joined Adelphi uh, two years ago, mainly in the framework of the Climate Diplomacy Initiative, uh, which is a collaboration between Adelphi and the German Federal Foreign Office um, that aims at strengthening the international debates around climate and security and the environmental peace building as well. So in the next, um, um, I'll try to be short so that we have time for questions, but in the next uh, um, five to eight minutes, uh, I really hope to also um, take a step back maybe and look at the broader context in which this discussion takes place, the framing of this discussion, how this is involved, uh, bring some uh, uh, practice from programming, uh, uh, and in a way also sum up a bit of what has been discussed today, what the other presenters before me have, uh, um, have talked about. Uh, and the evidence that they've shared. Um, next slide, please. So you've heard it already before from, uh, uh, from the presenters before me, uh, why it's important to uh, look at the uh, and understand the linkages between uh, conflict, between peace, and between um, environmental risks. And again, I'm going to focus here also on uh, climate change impacts exacerbating um, environmental risks on the ground. Well, it's important because uh, uh, this is what we're actually already seeing, what, what is already happening. Uh, if you look at this graph here, it shows you two indexes, one uh, that measures how vulnerable countries are to the impacts of climate change, so how exposed and sensitive they are to, the, to these impacts and how well they are prepared to cope with them. And the other uh, index uh, is the fragile states index on the vertical axis uh, that tells us how fragile a country is, so looking at the kind of governance uh, dimension, if you want a bit more. And when you overlap these two indexes, indexes, you can actually see that 70% of the most climate vulnerable countries are also in the most fragile, uh, uh, are also the most fragile countries. Um, so countries like Somalia, countries like Niger, Chad, Sudan. Um, and in other words, we're seeing an increasing confluence between climate change vulnerability and fragility all around the world. And this really leads us to understand how and to what extent climate change acts as a driver of conflict and fragility, but also so, and I think this is what is particularly valuable and uh, uh, important uh, uh, of this special issue, really highlighting what can be done to uh, use these impacts, uh, use this uh, situation that we're facing and um, to identify opportunities uh, for building peace. Next slide, please. Uh, please. And a lot of research has been dedicated already to this. We've seen, particularly when we look at the impact, uh, the debate between climate change, conflict, security, and peace, the early academic discussions at the end of the 90s, beginning of 2000, were really focusing on trying to understand whether there's a link between climate change and insecurity and conflict. Um, it was quite clear, both from evidence and from the research uh, and from practice, that there is a link. So research has then 
moved on uh, to a more complex and systemic understanding of climate related security risks, uh, climate and conflict risks, focusing on the conditions under which specific climate change impacts contribute to causing, intensifying or prolonging conflict. And of course, like every good academic debate, there are some differences in methodologies, different in assumptions, uh, but where most scholars agree is that these conditions are extremely multifaceted and context specific. So there's no deterministic threat that links automatically climate change to increase conflict and fragility, but climate impacts have an effect on security, on conflict when they interact with a larger web of existing social policy political and economic grievances that affect means and motivations for violence. And I think it's especially important to understand um, these uh, complex pathways because this is where then we can identify uh, the room for maneuver, the entry points for addressing these risks uh, and bring forward opportunities for peace building, conflict resolution, as well as, uh, of course, conflict prevention. Um, so if we look at uh, uh, the next slide, please. Um, here, uh, maybe we can just um, go a bit, a bit quicker on in these slides, um, given the time, but I basically um, put together some uh, uh, evidence uh, emerging from the research we'll be conducting on what, how some of these pathways uh, uh, look like in different contexts. Of course, this is a very general description and they play out in different ways in different contexts, but essentially we're seeing these dynamics between this complex relationship between climate change impact, environmental risks and conflict playing out through the impact in terms of access to natural resources. Of course, when scarcity, natural resource scarcity comes in, it's uh, more likely that groups, especially at the local level, where already some uh, tensions exist, it can enter into uh, conflict between each other. Uh, next slide, please. Um, of course, where livelihoods are undermined and a few presenters before me, uh, Sabrina and Hector, for example, highlighted the importance of livelihoods uh, in mediating between a lot of uh, the dynamics that exist between environmental risks and conflict. Of course, when livelihoods are undermined, uh, um, there, there are um, increasing opportunities, increasing risks of conflict, increasing risks of insecurity. Uh, human mobility is also affected uh, in the sense that uh, um, people are forced or are um, or feel like they need to leave their livelihoods, move, for example, to cities. And of course, migration is not a risk uh, in itself, but it becomes uh, it becomes difficult when uh, it goes to areas that are already underserved by services. It can create competition between local groups, between migrants and between uh, host communities. Uh, next slide, please. Um, of course, impacts of climate change, environmental risks uh, um, can uh, through extreme um, food prices and food insecurity can lead to protests, political instability. Uh, next slide, please. Again, I'm going to go very quickly here um, because I think it's more interesting to then focus on some of the solutions. Uh, challenges to government effectiveness and legitimacy, for example, when disasters hit, and we know that uh, one of the impacts of climate change is and will be an increased frequency and intensity of disasters, uh, of extreme events leading to disasters. And when governments are not perceived or not, not, not able to um, provide a response, provide aid, and reconstruct livelihoods after disasters hit, this can uh, give rise to political grievances. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, we also know that uh, it's uh, um, the governance dimension is key. So natural resource scarcity itself doesn't give rise to conflict. Migration in, in itself doesn't give rise to conflict, but it's where governance um, mechanisms, uh, institutions, for example, for conflict prevention, conflict management, institutions for natural resource management are weak, that these risks of insecurity, these risks of conflict are heightened, which of course is a, a bad news because it means that uh, if we are facing 
risks with governance, with governance situations, we risk having countries, we risk having societies trapped into a fragile conflict, uh, climate vulnerability, environmental degradation trap. Uh, but it's also um, on the good side. On the good side of this story, it, it also means that um, through interventions that address the governance dimension, there's really an entry point there for addressing some of these dynamics uh, on the ground. Uh, next slide, please. And here um, I've uh, um, focused on the on the case of Central Asia. Uh, many of you will be very familiar with it, um, but it, it's uh, without going too much into detail. It's a very good example of some uh, how some of these linkages uh, uh, between climate risks, between environmental risks, and insecurity and conflict can play out. Um, of course, uh, um, we know that the uh, main source of Central Asia's economy has traditionally been agriculture, particularly thirsty, thirsty crops such as cotton and rice that need intensive irrigation. Um, since um, the independence of Central Asian states in 1991, particularly water use has increasingly uh, has increased very rapidly in the region. Uh, essentially, you had all of the sudden it was a regional system for water management became a lot of national systems with competing needs and demands for irrigation, energy generation and so on. The difficulty of this increasing demand has been compounded by the impacts of climate change through changed rainfall patterns, increasing situations of water scarcity in some areas. And of course, you have also pockets within the region uh, that are uh, characterized where uh, already um, situations of instability, situations of uh, uh, border clashes, uh, ethnic clashes, think of, for example, the Fergana Valley were already present. And of course, and these dynamics uh, all play out with each other uh, can give rise to um, uh, to um, heightened conflicts, but also, um, again, and I think it's, uh, something that we've seen in the last few years, also with the change of government in Uzbekistan, also some opening uh, um, a more positive discourse and some opening for cooperation between the states uh, over the management uh, uh, of these resources. So once again, without going into detail, it's a good illustration, the dynamics of the region of how these linkages can play out and how the combination between climate change impacts, previous conflict dynamics, patterns of marginalization and exclusion, weak governance uh, can create or exacerbate security and conflict challenges, but also of how opportunities for cooperation can be created and arise. So what do we need to reduce these risks? Um, next slide, please. Uh, so what is essential to see here, and again, uh, um, what I hope uh, very briefly to have illustrated through the case of uh, Central Asia is that uh, these risks interact across different sectors and at different levels. So the responses to these risks um, should also span across sector, should also integrate across different sectors, looking at peace building, but also looking at solutions that may exist more in the realm of climate change adaptation, development interventions, security defense actions. And again, something that um, the presenters before me has, have also um, talked about. This sounds logical, um, yet if we do look at uh, the interventions that are at play in some of the conflict affected of fragility contexts on the ground, this is not what is actually happening. A lot of the strategies that address uh, climate change impacts uh, uh, kind of forget to look at the climate dynamic, at, at the conflict dynamics, forget the conflict dimension there. And a lot of the um, conflict uh, prevention, peace building interventions that we're seeing taking place on the ground forget to take into account the environmental or the climate dimension and how um, climate change impacts, how environmental risks often are drivers of conflict in themselves. So what do we need to fill this gap? First of all, we need the better assessment methodologies and capacities to conduct these assessments uh, uh, that uh, look at uh, um, um, both direct and indirect risks related to climate change, re related to um, the environmental context, as well as uh, possible entry points for addressing these risks. It's also important um, to develop better approaches to manage these risks, better approaches by institutions and processes that can function across sectoral silos. 
And there's a number, something quite interesting to see is that there's a number of growing, a growing number of pilot projects that try to address these risks in a more integrated way. Um, you see quite a few of them, for example, being implemented uh, within the UN system. You, the UN uh, Environmental uh, Programme, for example, has a project that was set up um, with the explicit intent to address these uh, environmental and, uh, and conflict risks uh, to uh, improve implement environmental peace building uh, in the right sense of the term. Um, the peace building fund, interestingly, is also like looking at the other spectrum, is also increasingly integrating climate change adaptation into its uh, traditionally peace building interventions in uh, uh, climate vulnerable contexts such as the Sahel. And um, evaluating these projects, uh, and a point that was made before, there's not enough of evaluations there. We definitely need to strengthen our understanding of uh, uh, these projects, um, why they're successful, how they're successful, what are the lessons learned from them. But from uh, um, some preliminary evaluations that we conducted as part of our research at Adelphi, there are some uh, um, activity areas that seem to be particularly um, suitable for um, for environmental peace building for grasping the peace opportunities uh, um, that uh, can be created on the ground. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Beatrice, can you please finish within the next 30 seconds? Yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm there. Uh, a few of these areas indeed are uh, improving natural uh, resource access and management. Uh, with, uh, with we, we've seen them uh, and discussed them in the presentations before, fostering sustainable livelihoods, particularly for vulnerable groups, working towards more legitimate, inclusive and efficient governance systems. So again, the governance dimension here, very important. And finally, highlighting uh, important to addressing exclusion and marginalization. Um, as, um, for example, um, targeting those groups that are traditionally excluded from decision-making and uh, um, I would like to stress that the youth as a target group, as Mirza's presentation also like before. And next and uh, last slide. Uh, just uh, a few kind of lessons learned and uh, areas for future activity and future focus, kind of mirroring what uh, Tobias was presenting at the beginning. Uh, the importance of focusing more on gender and social inclusion. It's not just about environment and the conflict dimension, but we really need to bring in the uh, social inclusion and gender dimension into our interventions, into our um, uh, into the activities that we implement on the ground. Uh, we need to become better and understanding these risks, these pathways. And to do this, we need to combine different methods. So quantitative analysis of climate, hydrological data, environmental aspects, merged with a granular and locally grounded conflict analysis, understanding the political economy, the local context uh, through qualitative methodologies inter alia. Uh, again, a point that was made um, by Tobias and also by other presenters, monitoring and evaluation and learning. Uh, we, don't, we don't know enough of uh, how these interventions uh, work and uh, what works and what doesn't work and how we can uh, better uh, capture climate change adaptation, environmental protection, peace building outcomes. And then finally, a more understanding of what works and what does not work uh, would also support potentially more flexible funding mechanisms uh, that can feel comfortable to fund climate change adaptation in conflict affected contexts and the integration of conflict sensitive approaches into climate change adaptation and environmental programming, which is uh, um, something that we still don't see on the ground and is uh, uh, very much would be very much needed. And with this, um, I uh, give the floor back to Tobias and thank you all for your attention and look forward to the questions. Thank you, Beatrice, and thank you to the four of you for the very insightful presentations. Um, the upside is you all took a bit longer to present your rich and nuanced insights, which I hope is appreciated by the audience. The downside is our discussion time has been shut call, uh, cut short by 24 out of 25 minutes allocated. Um, so that's a bit unfortunate, um, but at least I also have a follow-up um, meeting starting in five minutes. So I can't, uh, I think in, in sense of time and also considering that it's very late for some of our presenters, we, I encourage we don't really go over time. So my suggestion is we have 
two questions in the chat, one by Leonardo and one by Maria. Um, I'm not sure, perhaps I will read them and then I will give the panel the chance for each of the four presenters a very brief response before we close the session. I'm again, sorry that we don't have more time for audience engagement. So Leonardo Medina's question is, EP interventions seem to largely revolve around community empowerment through collaborative governance processes, enhancing cooperative relations and building social capital. However, I have found a limited focus on research over the role of social capital related concepts of environmental peace building effectiveness, for instance, social learning, adaptive governance, collective behavior change. Which do you think is the role of multi-stakeholder relational aspects in deliberative spaces during environmental peace building projects, for instance, in prioritizing peace building dimensions? Would you say there is a need for research in this topic? I'd definitely say yes, um, but let's say what the others say. And the second question by Maria is, um, I, see, I see that's not in the chat. Um, what do the speakers think about environmental peace in peace building in the case of the Siachen conflict, uh, the Siachen glacier, taking into consideration the water scarcity in India and Pakistan? Um, so these are the two questions, and I suggest we give each speaker around one minute to respond to either both or only one of the questions. And I suggest we go in the reverse order of the initial presentation. So starting with Beatrice and then uh, Mirza, Hector, and finally Sabrina. Great, thanks Tobias. And given that I spoke too much during my presentation, I'll be very brief here. Um, I'll take Leonardo's question and uh, I would agree with Tobias that there's a big need there. I think, uh, again, there's a need in general for more evidence of what works, what doesn't work. I think a lot of the evidence that we're seeing is very much focused on the community level and it's very much focused on uh, rural context. Particularly, I would say, with a bias from on, on Africa. So everything that doesn't fit into these three categories is uh, uh, very much needed. So, um, yeah, there's a um, lot of potential for um, us as researchers and practitioners to um, bring this uh, evidence to the fore. Over. Hi, um, I'd just like to answer the question on the Siachen Glacier. Um, so uh, scholarship on the Siachen Glacier, environmental peace building scholarship has um, um, you know, existed for the, I think since um, 2000. So there is a substantial amount of work that's looked at uh, the potential of peace parks in the Siachen Glacier. And um, you know, academics like Salim Ali, Ashok Swain, has done substantial work on um, evaluating whether uh, Siachen can be used as a peace building mechanism. Unfortunately, it has only been um, you know, relegated to academic discussion. So there has been no, um, no sort of uh, uh, progress in, in policy. And one of the reasons is that Siachen is a highly contested territorial conflict. And uh, I think, some of the literature by Tobias and others show that um, environmental peace thing does not succeed when the national security and military state uh, apparatuses um, attach a lot of importance to it. So I think it's more worthwhile to kind of um, look at environmental peace, thing, peace building in uh, areas which are not as contested, um, one of them being the, uh, you know, the Thar Desert, perhaps, um, or um, more specifically, the, uh, the Sir Creek area in the Thar Desert. So I don't really see any um, progress in, in Siachen becoming a mechanism for environmental peace building in the near future. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so I will refer to the question about the, the role of multi-stakeholder relational aspects in deliberative spaces. So I say, yeah, for sure it's super important and, it, and it, we need to conduct more and more research about it because peace building is basically a relational aspect. So 
environmental science can offer discussions, but they are never neutral. And once you enter into a region that is affected by conflict, then you become part of the conflict. And then addressing these power asymmetries and knowing these relational aspects is super important. And there are some research already conducted in the fields of social capital or social cohesion, but it is, it is needed to, to prioritize and to address actively, uh, uh, systemically um, the conflicts. And in my research, for example, the um, uh, practitioners from agricultural science, they recognize that uh, they didn't have the skills to, to embrace dialogue systematically, for example. This is something that could be uh, addressed better in a, a programming of environmental peace building. Okay, I will just shortly intervene. I think um, most of the speakers have addressed uh, the questions very well, but I mean, I would also like to um, quickly respond to Leonardo's um, question. Um, I think that there's also a lot of progress being done in the field of environmental peace building to take social capital dimensions uh, more um, into account in research. It is still, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, research still missing, but I mean, even for example, um, in, the, in the presentation uh, by Tobias, he was mentioning um, the need uh, or the importance of, for example, bottom-up approaches and um, also the focus on livelihoods, which uh, I was briefly talking about. Um, and this is also already changing a bit uh, the focus of, of research in environmental peace building. Um, and I would say that we're slowly moving towards um, understanding as well the, the importance of adaptive of concepts like adaptive governance of um, local learning processes, uh, local knowledge production processes. And I, I think that this is something that uh, we will, I mean, we will be growing um, within the next uh, few years of environmental peace building research, but it is still super, super important to, to better grasp that. Okay, thanks a lot for the four interesting presentations, the good questions, the debate, the positive comments in the chat. Thanks again for Mesa and the OECD Academy for hosting this event.